Right, in this video, we're gonna talk about limits and continuity for functions of several variables. This lecture goes along with section 4.2 of the OpenStax textbook calculus volume three. So we introduced these functions of several variables in the last video. We're gonna now find limits and verify continuity for them. It's good to review limits in two dimensions before we do that. Uh, you hopefully recall that uh, the limit as a function approach to point was based on approaching it from both sides. So let's say that this is A. And this is G of A. So we need the limit as X goes to A from the left to equal the limit as x goes to a from the right. So those left and right limits, you know, needed to match up. If they did, then you have your overall limit as x goes to a of x. And it didn't matter if the actual point wasn't in there until you got to continuity, right? This function is discontinuous because it's got removable discontinuity, but its limit still exists because the left limit and right limit both go to that hole right there. Uh, in contrast, you can see in the right side, the left and right limits are different and therefore uh, the limit of this one uh, does not exist. Now in three dimensions, we don't just have a left limit and a right limit, we actually have an infinite number of paths to get to the limit point because our domain, instead of being one dimensional is two dimensional. Uh, we can never actually test all these paths. So we usually just try something parallel to the x-axis, something parallel to the y-axis, and then some kind of diagonal line uh, to test it. And if those three all agree, uh, then we usually uh, maybe look at a graph too, uh, and then assume that the limit uh, is whatever those numbers are all equal to. And the notation you see here uh, says that uh, the limit as the input, uh, which is a pair of numbers, x, y, approaches some point in two space, two, one in this case, uh, of the function. So similar notation with lim and the arrow, uh, but instead of x going to a, we have x comma y going to a comma b. Now remember our function of two variables is a big curved sheet floating in space. Um, and the uh, limit point for the domain is some point here in the xy plane. Uh, we still have the epsilon delta relationship that we had with limits in one dimension. Um, and it's perhaps more important here since we don't just have uh, two one-sided limits to take in order to get the overall limit. But remember that delta is how close we wanted to be to the input and epsilon is how close we wanted to be to the output. Um, but since you can be you know, anywhere around the point in a two-dimensional space, uh, you end up getting a disk uh, instead of an interval around that limit point. Here's the official definition from the book. Uh, the limit as x, y approaches a, b of f of x, y equal to L. Uh, and so L is still just a single number because the output of these functions is still a single number. And so here's the epsilon delta definition. When you study this, you wanna compare it to the epsilon delta definition for a function of a single variable, right? Uh, and it's very similar. If for every epsilon greater than zero, uh, there exists a delta such that the distance between the uh, input and the destination point, um, and that's what they have here, that for all points x, y in a delta disk around a, b, that's the two-dimensional version, this is the one-dimensional version, uh, then f is with an epsilon of l, uh, you have right here. So I guess this is your distance in two dimensions between x, y, and a, b. You want it to be between zero and delta 
So I guess that's the two-dimensional version of this. Uh, as with limits of functions of single variables, the uh, interesting examples to study are ones where limits don't exist. So here is one such example. We want to find the limit as xy approaches the origin for uh, this function here, 2xy over 3x squared plus y squared. So the first path we're going to take is the x-axis, and that's where y is equal to 0. So when you pick one of these horizontal vertical lines, you can just put that constant in for that variable. So here we're going to replace y with 0. And of course, what we're looking at is approaching this origin point on the x-axis from either side. So when y is replaced with 0, then each of the y's in the expression get replaced with 0. And what this does is it reverts it back to a function of a single variable. Uh, now, in this case, the zero on the top actually makes the entire thing zero. Uh, and so for y equal to zero, the function is equal to zero. And uh, so then the limit becomes very obvious. Uh, the limit is just zero. Similarly, if we use the y-axis, uh, we're going to now have x equal to zero. So we'd replace all the x's in the expression with zeros. This also gives us zero here. Now, in general, this could still be a function of y, you know, and then this one could have been a function of x. Uh, if that's the case, you still need to then take the limit as x goes to zero, uh, or here, the limit as y goes to zero. Um, but once we put in this first variable, it actually simplified down to the answer right away. All right, uh, so, so far so good because you want these paths to all match up, right? And so the first two paths, the limit agrees at zero. Now we want to do something that's not a horizontal or a vertical line, but it does need to go through the origin. So I'm going to use the line y equals x, and let's see that. We'll be approaching along that diagonal line with slope 1. And so I can replace y with x in the equation. So each of the y's in the function equation get replaced with x. And uh, you notice now that it uh, simplifies to 1 half. So this last limit is 1 half, and the first two were 0. Now, if all the limits agree, that suggests that that value they're all agreeing to is the limit. But if any one of the limits is different, then the limit does not exist for the same reason that it didn't when we had left and right limits not matching up in functions of a single variable. So this one half being different from those two previous limits of zero tells me right away that the limit does not exist. Um, now you can use the epsilon delta definition. It's supposed to be for every epsilon greater than zero. You could pick epsilon to be one quarter. Uh, and then using this path, uh, you're going to get that the uh, that the deltas, uh, that you can pick pretty much any delta you want, and you're going to have points where uh, the limit and the value of the function are, are off by a half, which is greater than a quarter. So this would contradict that, and so the limit does not exist. Yeah, so you could have the value of the function along this line is 1 half, uh, and then if you said the limit was 0 from the previous two, uh, then you can see that the difference between that is greater than epsilon. So this limit does not exist. If you take a look at this function, got a link here to calcplot, and you just type in the function here, and then you can kind of look at it. You see that at the origin, it really does have some interesting behavior. Uh, you've got some limits going to positive one half, right, at the top along that top ridge. And then you've got some limits going to, uh, it looks like negative one half. And then you've got some other limits going to zero. So depending on which way you approach the origin on this thing, you're headed for different values. 
So that kind of weird behavior ends up leading to the limit not existing at zero. Now we only took three paths. Again, there are infinite number of paths you could take. You don't have to take a linear path. Any function that goes, or sorry, any equation that goes through the limit point would work. Um, and so you could take a parabolic path. Uh, so here's another path where y equals x squared. The important thing is that you do go through the limiting point of the origin. And uh, sometimes these are actually better to use and can help you find the value better than a linear path. Uh, if we replace y with x squared in the expression, um, we end up getting uh, 2x cubed over 3x squared plus x to the fourth. And that simplifies the 2x over 3 plus x squared. At that point, you need to take the limit as x goes to 0. Uh, if you do, then the top goes to 0 and the bottom goes to 3. Uh, and so this limit agrees with the first two uh, at being 0. Um, which is fine. Uh, again, the more you get that agree, the better, but any one of them not agreeing and the overall limit does not exist. So there's a bunch of limit laws that are introduced here, and a lot of them are the same as limits for functions of a single variable. So uh, limit of a constant is the constant. A limit of a single variable is just that coordinate for the limiting point. Uh, limits can be distributed across sums or differences or through a constant. Uh, limit of the products is the product of limits. Limit of the quotients is the quotient of the limits. Uh, limit can be distributed through an exponent, it's positive integer, uh, and through a root if it's odd uh, and positive or even and positive. Moving on to continuity, uh, just a quick review of the three conditions for continuity for a function of a single variable, which are brought up in Calc 1, which one of these is not necessary for continuity. And the correct answer is D. You don't need the limit as x goes to infinity to be infinity, uh, but you do need the first three. The function has to be defined at the point, the limit has to exist at the point, and the limit uh, at the point has to be equal to the value of the function there for it to be continuous at that point. Here's the very similar definition of continuity for a function of two variables, same three conditions, uh, that the value of the function exists, that the limit exists, and that those first two are equal. So a couple of theorems here about continuity. Uh, if two functions are continuous, then their sum is continuous. If two functions are continuous, then their product is continuous. And if two functions are continuous and they can be composed, then their composition is continuous. Now, the way you could use those is to take a more complicated function and show that it's continuous from simpler functions. So consider this function of two variables, cosine of 4x cubed y squared plus 3. Uh, since we know that uh, the identities for x and y and then the number 4 are all continuous from, from these properties of limits, Then using theorem 4.3 about the product, you could then multiply uh, four, three x's, and two y's, and it's still a continuous function. Uh, you can also add on a three, because the three is continuous, and the four x cubed y squared is. And then cosine's continuous, and so is this, so their composition is going to be continuous. So just look at all the components in the function, and if all those operations seem continuous, then you should be OK. Uh, I just wanted to point out that if you're looking for where a function of two variables is continuous, often it's easy to just do this when you're checking for its domain. So if you had function of x, y equal to sine of x, y, right, you can put anything you want in there for x and y, so its domain is all real numbers, and it's going to be continuous for all real numbers. 
on the other hand, if you had a function that has a restricted domain, like this square root, uh, then your domain is restricted to where x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to four so that you don't get square root of a negative. Um, that's the domain. That's also the region of continuity. And if you look at natural log, you remember that uh, you need the input for the natural log or the argument to be positive. So you need x plus y to be positive. So that's the domain for this function. Uh, and that's also where it's going to be continuous. So when you find these domains uh, that are continuous subsets of R2, uh, that usually tells you the domain and the region of continuity for it. And then it's the boundaries of these that you have to worry about uh, if they are some subset of R2. All right, that's it for 4.2. This presentation by Matthew Watts contains images and text from Calculus Volume 3 by Jed Herman and G. Strange, CC by NCSA OpenStax.